Welcome to episode one of What's On Your Mind, a new weekly series brought to you by the Institute of Trading and Portfolio Management, where I'll be talking to senior trading mentors Raj Malhotra and Jason McDonald this week about what's on their mind in the financial markets. So I'm your host, Chris Quill, and as I said, I'm joined by Raj Malhotra and Jason McDonald. And if you guys at home want to know more about what we do at the Institute and learn more about trading and investing, all you need to do is jump onto our website, itpm.com, and follow some links to check out our upcoming live seminars, our educational courses, bite-sized videos, and mentoring programs. So with that being said, let's go over to you, Raj, and talk about what's been on your mind this week in the financial markets. So a few things have been going on in, in my mind right now. The, the, first of all, it's um, in terms of the tariffs. Um, so I've been thinking about this. How long is China really willing to go to the mattresses to prove that they will not bow to U.S. tariffs? I mean, if you look at what the market, the Chinese market's down almost 20 percent from its high, while the rest of the world continues to either flatline or rally. So how long are they willing to play this game? I mean, the, the, the difference, I think, between China and a lot of other co countries is they basically, um, President Xi has, I think he's in power for pretty much as long as he wants, as so it seems. So he, unlike other, some other leaders, can play the long game, and in his case, the really long game. I mean, it looks like a, a coordination, a coordinated effort from China literally to wait out the Trump administration. Like, it, and he, he, he's, he can wait for maybe eight years. But I, I, my, 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 my concern is how will the people start to, um, will, will it start to be unrest amongst the people? And when that does, does that really, does he actually bow to change? Uh, you know, it's what's very interesting really to me, this whole US America first policy, while it's basically shunned by all the elitist globalists, has actually had implications that most that almost nobody really expected it's basically for example in turkey argentina this caused a mini em crisis i mean it basically i think what's happened was all these other countries problems have previously been hidden you know because of this global coordinated effort thinking that everyone needs to work together and everyone will benefit but as the us has moved towards this policy you can the cracks in these com in these countries and their problems that really come to the forefront. And yeah, I think, I think some of the problems. Right. Yeah, I think some of the problems that you refer to, Raj, as you say, they've been going on in the background, and maybe um, those less observant have not noticed it. So um, you've mentioned Argentina and Turkey, and but and, and certainly, you know, these are not suddenly crises that have kind of cropped up in the last few weeks they've actually been going on for some time but you're right in that the the tariff stuff and the trade war issues have, have obviously brought these things really to the fore um i think certainly in terms of what trump has said about the war the trade war hurting china more than the us that's certainly been borne out hasn't it in terms of what we've seen in the stock market and, and also in terms of what seems to be happening with Chinese growth figures as well. Mm -hmm. So I think you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, and I think you can see it most most uh, clear in the last month if you look at uh, basically the the um, move to value stocks over growth or all the previous market leaderships. Like, for example, let's look at a, uh, a few charts here. So here is first a chart of the SPY. As you can see, the market is pretty flat for the last month. and then. The first one is, uh, I'm going to bring up a chart right here of Kimberly Clark, KMB. As you can see from this chart in the last month, it's went from 105 to 116, a 10% plus move, which I don't think we would, anyone would uh, argue that tissue paper is the market leadership around the U.S. or the world right now. Let's pull up another one. Let's look at, uh, here, okay. here's Hershey Chocolate, a, a, um, HSY. As you can see, it's went from 93 to 100 in the last month. and if you remember this previously to the last month, most consumer goods, um, food stocks, any any kind of processed foods have pretty much gotten hammered, like Kraft Heinz, Campbell's Soup until recently due to M&A activity. But basically, the, as the world has moved from processed foods to organic, healthy foods, these stocks have been left in the dust. 
However, in the last month, they've had a turnaround. So I think that's okay. a big part of the, you know, move from growth to value. And as are, like, you, are, you, are you seeing like a change in leadership? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I, and I'll let me pull up one more. Here's a uh, Clorox CLX. It looks it looks like here it's went from 135 to 145. Uh -huh. Also a seven and a half percent move. Again, from Clorox, if you don't know, basically it makes laundry detergent. So you're seeing this market leadership change. And my question so are these kind of fairly, you know, sort of consumer staples, very unexciting, boring companies. Exactly. And and usually that other means one of two things. That a lot of times that means that uh are we in the final innings of a rally where when the dogs basically rally, the stocks that haven't rallied finally start to move higher, and as the leadership is stalled, or is this actually just a sign that, and and this is probably a contrary um, opinion to most that this America First policy is actually good for the U.S. stock market as a whole, contrary to most globalist theory that these tariffs will kill the U.S. stock market and world markets around the. the uh, uh, markets around the world because we're moving, but because what's happened, the unintended consequence is that we moved into value and defensive equities because money has to go somewhere. With that, they're not going to go to emerging markets. So the, the, so the mo people will just buy sure. stuff. Yeah. Well, it's really someone unaffected. Like, I don't think that uh, soap and laundry detergent and chocolate is high on the tariff list as opposed to big, expensive goods. So is that because um, you feel that growth stocks rely more on other countries rather than the domestic sort of U.S. territory, or is it something else? I think it's a bit of both. I think I think part of it is uh, I, I really think the most of it is because we're just moving in move, as money has to go somewhere as it's being sold in emerging markets and and uh, fund managers don't necessarily want to buy the same big tech names. They they just want to basically be in something safer with a uh, a dividend yield and uh, you know a repeatable business. They, and 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 they don't mind getting small to you know small small returns. I mean not not the returns like the twenty plus return the SP had last year, but low single digits is probably okay. Yeah. And obviously, if you time the rotation correctly, then as you can see, you can make uh, double-digit returns in yeah. in less than a month as well. I mean, I, I, I mean, I definitely don't think this was um, some Trump. Um, this was his. Uh, he thought this was going to happen, or he had any idea this was going to happen. But it has, and I think contrary. Is a well, very, so you don't think he's Long Hershey? I don't think he's. Well, he might be Long McDonald's because he. <laughs> yeah. I'm it does need a lot of that, but I certainly don't think this was a coordinated effort. This is what the administration thought was going to happen, but it's also contrary to what most, uh, you know, most stock market gurus would say that this was, that, you know, that how bad this policy was. In fact, it actually might be good for the broader U.S. market, and I don't really think anyone's really positioned this way. No, that's definitely not the consensus view, is it? And and as you and I have both seen over pretty long careers, you know, often when something becomes such a consensual um, belief ex expressed in um, the form of, uh, you know, being overweight a particular sector or certain stocks that, uh, you know, you, you don't really want to be late into that party because um, at some stage that consensus um is going to unravel, and and when it does unravel, it can it can get pretty, uh, you know, it can be quite damaging. Um, you know, maybe another example of that is is what's happened to the oil price um, this year as well. Very consensual trade to be long oil earlier on this year, um, and one might think that with cuts to Iranian production, uh, sorry, Iranian supply on the basis of what's coming at the end of the year in terms of the sanctions, that that might have the opposite effect to actually what's happened to the oil price. Um, and obviously, we've got the, the US dollar move implications in there as well. Um, there's one thing that I wouldn't mind discussing as well, Raj, as you brought it up. You, you mentioned emerging markets um, earlier on, and, and in particular Turkey. So that kind of neatly 
dovetails in with um, a feature that, that has you, you can't really ignore in Europe this week, um, starting from sort of the end of last week, particularly Friday onwards. Um, I tend to, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at the uh, European equity markets and, uh, you know, the, the, the dramatic effect from the precipitous fall of the Turkish lira has really been felt over this side of the Atlantic, um, certainly for the last uh, four or five business days. Um, as you probably um, have noticed as well, Raj, you know, often in August in the Northern Hemisphere, we get uh, volumes are very much reduced, uh, which also can tend to lead to higher volatility as well, because, of course, many people are on holiday, particularly um as it turns out, in Southern Europe, um, which is essentially, effectively, where we've seen much of the sort of um, the real hits come in terms of overall indices and particularly the banks in places like Spain, Italy and France. Um, that has been put down by the kind of uh, the mainstream media to um, ripple effects from Turkey because Spanish, French, Italian banks have all got some exposure to Turkey, but to put that into context, first of all, you know, the Turkish lira crisis has been going on for much of the year. It's not a new thing. It didn't just suddenly drop only last week. Um, secondly, if we look at the numbers, um, although I think Spain has got uh, an $83 billion total exposure um, to Turkish loans, um, I think the figure is uh, something like $38 billion for Italy, these numbers sound like large standalone numbers, but actually, when you look at um, the top European banks' um, assets in total, we're talking about uh, $20 trillion, then obviously that those numbers, you know, you can put them into, into context. I think what is more of an issue is the, is the whole universe of emerging markets so, for example, um, the, the JP Morgan Emerging Markets um, Bonds ETF, that, which has the ticket EMB, um, that's one that's been on my radar for quite a long, uh, for quite uh, um, a long period this year. If you have a look at that chart, which I'm going to share with you guys now, um, you know, that's been basically going down for most of the year, certainly since the end of January. Um, similarly, uh, the uh, the JP Morgan index of emerging market currencies hit a record low um, earlier this week. So it's not just Turkey. You know, people are talking about contagion um, from Turkey to Brazil and Argentina to South Africa to India, Indonesia and Peru. These countries, a lot of them have got certain things in common, which is which is clearly that not only do they have large budget deficits and balance of payments deficits, but also they have uh, large percentages of GDP are, uh, in terms of their debt, um, is denominated in, in US dollars. And guess what's been a strong currency this year? So, um, you know, we're, we're back again, kind of to your theme again, Raj, of, uh, you know, what the, the administration has been up to in the US. I think one of the interesting kind of corollaries of, the, of what's been happening as well is that uh, normally in this type of risk off, atmosphere, you'd expect to see US Treasuries rally, which we have indeed seen, uh, rally in German Bund, which has happened to an extent as well. But the other one, which has been uh, behaving strangely, um, given that it's supposedly a safe haven, is, is gold. The, the gold price has actually fallen during this most recent period, which I found, I mean, I don't really trade gold. Uh, it's not something that I've um, traded historically, but it's obviously something that's kind of on the radar. That's uh, seen as a safe haven for sure. It's actually gone in the opposite direction. So I thought that was quite an interesting move right. as well. If you um, look at gold as a hedge to everything else is kind of a an old an old wives tale. I mean, you know, okay. like, yeah. I, I a lot of uh, I think hedging. I mean, people use a hedge as I think that's the most overused term in trading where something is not it, by buying a different asset class is supposed to act a certain way and mm -hmm. it's clearly not a hedge you you it's a my, my point is simply right if you're just buying gold thinking that gold will act the way it's supposed to act when 
contagion happens and uh, volatility uh, occurs is just a bad way to just just don't do it as traders out there. Completely don't. agree. Totally agree. I have a few questions about what you said. So you, you talked about the volatility given seasonality. I remember when I worked at BNP, August, there were times I'd look around the floor, there were three people working in August, but it seemed like a national holiday for a whole month. Bank. <laughs> exactly. So do you think um, the move in in, in Turkey, um, would, it, would it have been this severe if we were sitting here in, say, March rather than August? Um. It's difficult for me to say in terms of I'm not an expert on Turkey, um, right. so I don't, you know, I'm not sure how how deep that market is. But I I certainly would say that generally across the board, in my experience of Europe um, and the UK, is is that in August um, mm -hmm. volumes definitely do, definitely. Lot. Um, and you know that as and, and as we know that often. With lower volumes, you do get high volatility because, let's face it, if you're a market maker, um, if you're putting up risk, um, if liquidity is lower, you are going to widen your bid offer spreads. So, it's it put it this way: it's not a surprise. We've seen this kind of thing happen before. The really obvious one that we um, all remember of relative recent times is is the Chinese devaluation in August 2015, which caused widespread declines across equity markets and commodities again. So, yeah, I would say that the August effect, um, if that's what we're going to call it, is 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 definitely one of the factors. Yeah. And also, I think, you know, maybe you can shed some light on, of course, you know, this year we've got the U.S. midterm elections as well. And, um, you know, I've seen bits and pieces talking about in I, I, I don't like to sort of you know, assume that the world will always behave as it has done in the past. But of course, you have to take note of some of these things that do seem to recur more often than other things. And one of those things that people discuss in, in this particular vein is is that often um, across Q3 in the year of uh, uh, midterm elections, that basically the market doesn't do anything. Um, if anything, you know, it's, it's not a particularly profitable quarter for the market uh, and that um, you know it, sensibly people are kind of waiting to see what the outcome of the the midterms are going to be I mean do you have anything to to uh, share with us on on, on that uh, aspect of things yeah I think one thing about the midterms is historically um, and almost without fail the the non-ruling party and whoever the president is the other party always gains seats in the house. The Senate in this case is pretty much going to be, uh, I think that Republicans are at like five or six seats. If anything, that will increase, which is, so they were, they were pretty safely keep that chamber. The House is mm -hmm. for grabs. That, 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 the House, as you know, if, well, if you don't know, it's basically each state gets, um, there's 435 reps. Each state gets uh, how many reps, given how many, given the amount of people they have. As opposed to the Senate, each state has two senators. So I, right. some, yeah. states, some states have two senators and one rep, and then someone like California has 55 reps. So okay, yeah. So but, uh, anyway, but the House historically goes um, moves away from the uh, ruling party. So and it's it's been rare actually that they would that, that the House hasn't actually flipped. Although this one, it looks like the the, Dem the Republican might actually keep the majority, even though it'll end up being very it'll probably be very close either way. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how it feels over there, but but from from here, it, it looks like the Democrats are almost in uh, is in as much disarray as the Labour Party over here, um, in that they seem to have somewhat of potentially an open goal, and 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 yet they seem to be able to miss it. I mean, the Democrats are moved so far to the left where they're embracing socialism. It's, it's not even a secret; <laughs> they're outright embracing how socialism will work this time. I, I mean, I. I I don't. I don't think you can. Uh, I, I don't think you could. You could run like a worse campaign than basically embracing that as the. Here, here's the counter to Trump. We hate Trump. Let's try socialism. Yeah, it doesn't sound particularly. That doesn't sound like a winning strategy to me no. from the other side of the Atlantic. No. Uh, no, definitely not. I mean, speaking of uh, governments that don't function, what, when you were talking about Turkey earlier, what 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 do you think are the proper steps for them to if what what should they be doing? Not that not that Erdogan will actually do anything that 
you you say, but uh, or yeah. any, we'll say. But like, what what is the way to actually fix that problem other than to release? I, I mean, it seems asinine to me. We won't release this one guy, so we're going to double. We're going to cripple our our economy because we don't like this one religious leader. We won't release this religious leader. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I, I guess if you're going to write a textbook on on how not to um, handle a crisis well, uh, Erdogan could could be right up there with, with with the kind of blueprint for that. So yeah, let, let's look at what he's done. He's basically um, assumed control of uh, most of the sort of major economic decision making, including appointing his own. I think it's his nephew or one of his relatives to become the finance minister. Yeah, it's yes, yeah, it's one of his relatives. And, and he's, you know, talking about interest rates uh, being the main determinant of inflation, I believe, which um, kind of uh, misses the point in terms of what he needs to do to try and at least stabilize his currency. So uh, I suggest he needs to, well, he needs to do make almost like a kind of Damascene uh, a road to Damascus type conversion in terms of doing basically the opposite of almost everything that he's done over the last uh, few years. Um, so, you know, what's the likelihood of that? Um, I think you'd have to say relatively low. Um, but I think the whole, you know, the Turkey issue is it's not something that I'm overly concerned about because it isn't actually, you know, such a big deal. It's, I think, more interesting is you know, whether it has some kind of knock on effect um, around the place rather than just Turkey um, as a standalone situation. Um, but the answer to your question is he literally has to do everything the opposite to what he's been doing. Um, <laughs> George so, <laughs> yeah. So I guess we're, we're putting a relatively low probability on that. Um, but uh, the other thing I think that uh, we were discussing offline before um was this i think you had uh, a couple of uh, options ideas didn't you that you were going to speak about um, and share yeah. with um so uh, you know so let me bring up here so uh, yeah so i was looking at a uh, you know because uh you know every talk in the head every in the media everyone wants to talk about tesla uh, and for whatever reason, because I actually share an interesting story. When I was at uh, when I was in Wharton my freshman year, uh, I think I, I signed up for some, it was the entrepreneurial club or something. But anyway, I was sitting in my dorm room and this guy walks in. He's an MBA student. He's like, "Don't you? I'm the president of the entrepreneurial society. Um, I heard you might want to be interested in joining." You know, he sat in there and talked to me for a few minutes, and he was actually Elon Musk. <laughs> right. He was a graduate student, and I was a freshman, so. Could you could you spot the genius in, in that meeting? Uh, honestly, I, I just got to college. I probably had like four beers, so I was <laughs> 18 years old. So I probably didn't see the genius at the time. It wasn't evident at that point. No, I mean he walked into my dorm room, so that that obviously he's he's uh was in a worse place now. He was in a worse place. <laughs> <then. laughs> Have you have you have you seen him around the villages? Well, I suppose he. I, I guess he lives on the west coast. Yeah, he, I haven't seen him since then. But yeah. anyhow, so it, it, you know, to me, everyone wants to talk about it. I mean, I think it's a fool's game uh, to try and trade this because there's hundreds of other good trades out there. I completely agree with you. I mean, having totally. said that, if you are an addict, which some of you may be, it, and you, I, pre, I prefer Tesla to heroin. So if you are an <laughs> addict and you have to play Tesla. There are a few option strategies that can work here. No, number one, first of all, if you're long the call because you're a believer in Elon Musk and you're blindly follow, it's like you're it's like a the David Koresh cult where you must follow the the cult leader. You need to be long the stock. Um, I, I definitely think you should sell a covered call, and for a few reasons. Number one, you know, uh, for protection. But the the real reason is now the stock is rallied because of the the uh, thought of taking it private. Yeah, the options markets. What happens? The way it happens in an LBO is, if you, if you don't, uh, so say that they LBO or they go private at four twenty is like the price a lot of people are. So talking. Raj, just just briefly, so just for those people that don't know what an LBO is, um, so could you just briefly? Yeah. An LBO is leverage buyout. Essentially, um, Musk would borrow a lot of money to buy back all the stock at. 
a, a peg price and take the company private. He basically take you out of the equity. He's apparently going to get funding from the Saudis and right, yeah. That, they'll buy back all the stock, and now they're no longer a public company. Uh huh. The price that they've been talking about in the media, the rumored price is around four hundred and twenty dollars. So if you sell an upside call somewhere near that price or or there or higher. I mean, first of all, as you know, if, if you're, you're buying it back at 420, any calls above 420 are, are going to be worthless. Yep. And it is. Second of all, as an LBO, um, the, if you sell a long dated option, there's option premium baked into it. You know, as you know, with time to maturity is in addition to volatility, those are the two biggest uh, factors. So if you're selling an upside call, you can actually collect some pretty good premium. Yeah, I mean, Mike, what, what happened to, to implied vol in, in the Tesla options after he made this uh, extraordinary announcement? Simply enough, and uh, I, I don't have to share it on the screens up right now, but if you look at upside calls, they're actually – usually what would happen in a name like this is that the, uh, the implied vols and upside calls would come down tremendously. But in fact, it hasn't. In fact, it's still – and some of them, they're, they're higher than even at the money walls, which um, I was actually surprised at that. Wow. Okay. Oh, so, so your strategy, this is this would be good timing for this strategy. Yeah, it absolutely would be. If you're long a call, you definitely should consider selling calls above this, above 400, 410, 420. Your long stop. Yeah. In fact, like, uh, and another thing for the real faint part, this is a trade that I've I, that I was that I've actually done is uh. I bought a one by two call spread, meaning like you sell, you buy like a, say a 360 strike call mm -hmm. and sell two of the 420 strike calls. So in that, in that case, you can actually, you might be able to even collect some premium. Yeah. Buying one 360, selling two of the 420s and you don't start losing money until the stock goes above 480. And 480? That, well, yeah. If you buy one of the 360s and sell two of the 420s, yeah. So say the stock goes to 480, you make 180 dollars on your 360 call, and then you lose. Uh, I'm sorry, you lose. You make 120 dollars on the 360 call, yeah. and on the 420, you lose 60 dollars on each one. So yeah. break right. even to 480 up there, and that's, you can be able to get that on it as a credit. And that, that stock, sounds like a pretty good idea. Yeah, that's that's a pretty good down, down, play, isn't it? That's the premium, and if it goes anywhere between 360 and 420 at expiration, you'll make money. Yeah. Yeah, that's a smart idea. Yeah. And and I think if you're short, just given all the names, given all the uh, uncertainty here, which to me is probably, I, I don't have a strong opinion. I could see either way. But if you are, probably uh, a put spread makes sense, just given like, the risk, the takeout risk. Rather than going naked short, yeah. Which, yeah. I mean, just, as, we, as, as we all know, has, has, has been basically, uh, you know, digging a grave. Yeah, like I said, I've never I've never been a big Tesla believer, but it only takes one really rich Saudi to, to be a believer. So that's all that I, I totally agree with you. I, I you know I think there's this misconception that as traders we need to have a view and therefore a position on everything. And I just and that's obviously just not the case. You know, for me, I've just put that stock in the kind of too hard basket. You know, it's like I can't buy it for the obvious fundamental reasons that we're all well rehearsed in but shorting it again as you mentioned the word cult earlier and that is precisely you know you have a personality cult here virtually mm. um so yeah you know why you know if you don't need to trade it why trade it but i think if you've got a position where you're long stock then i think your covered call idea is a really good idea and obviously if you must you know if you, if you feel that you must trade it then i think you've given people a couple of great ideas to, to kind of think about there but um as you say you know we don't have to trade this stock or or no. the options around it but but there's some pretty smart ideas there yeah i will say i'll say the one two trade i did i do like that one by two because i do believe there was a pretty anytime there's takeout risk and uh if you think about this if, if right now they're saying there's a it's going to go private and the two scenarios are number one it does number two they said, okay, we're not going private. That probably means that there's something was wrong with the company. So for it, for it to go above 480 at this point after not going private would seem kind of uh, hard for, for me to think in six to nine months, given yeah. that it was a 
<laughs> to go much higher than the the taking private price. I just don't. I I find that hard. I find it's I find that hard to see how that works out. Well, certainly during that time period as well. Yeah. Yeah. Jason, going back to you briefly, um, you were talking about um, Turkey and the effects that it might have in Europe and European banks, particularly. Do you want to touch a bit more about uh, touch a bit more on um, whether you think that's significant, or whether you think there's other factors at play that are more important, like U.S. dollar or or anything like that? Okay, yeah. So, I mean, in terms of just. Uh... You know, Turkey itself, I gave you some, some numbers earlier on. Um, the, uh, I actually, I think I gave you an erroneous Italian figure. So the, the, the figure for the Italian banks exposure is 17 billion, one seven. Um, it's the Spanish banks that have more exposure, which was 83 billion. Um, so, you know, the way that it works in terms of Italy is that the, the main index there, the MIB, um, the two large banks in Italy, Unicredit and um, San Paolo Emi, they've they account for I think it's about 20, 25 percent of the index. So um, you know the the idea of the kind of weakness in European banks and you know all the MPL, the non-performing loan issues. This this these are all well rehearsed arguments that have been around for some time. Um, actually, in the last year or so. The Italian banks have actually done quite a bit in terms of cleaning up their balance sheets, and Unicredit had a had a big capital raise last year as well. Uh, plus, they've managed to shift some of the MPLs off. Um, so, actually, you know, I think if you're going to bet against these banks, you need to do your homework and actually really um, look at them on a case by case basis. But Unicredit, it's essentially it owns 40% of Turkey's fourth largest bank. Um, and I think, you know, the worst case scenario that I've seen out there is that if that were to basically have to be written off completely, which, of course, is, is an extreme um, assumption, that the worst case would be a 4% hit to their equity. So, you know, not fantastic, but 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 not a, um, you know, it's not going to take the bank down. I think what's um, of more interest is what the general kind of move in terms of the dollar and dollar interest rates and a generally kind of dollar tightening um, global scenario where, you know, essentially with the rally in the dollar and um, what the Fed's been doing and actually the attractiveness now on a relative basis in real yield terms of the US Treasury market, this is all co contributing to a, a tightening US dollar liquidity picture and of course, that's led to a rising dollar. And I think that that is very much not uh, an outcome that many people were expecting at the beginning of the year. So we've been discussing this in the Institute for some time, and we, we see a pain trade there where um, people are, um, they, haven't, they haven't been expecting the strength in the dollar that, that has been, that, that's occurred this year. And that has actually fed through, you know, to what's happened in the emerging markets. It's all part of the same situation, um, as as we referred to earlier on with with the U.S. dollar denominated debt situation. If, if you borrow in U.S. dollars um, and U.S. dollar interest rates go up and your currency plunges against the U.S. dollar, hey presto, guess what is happening to your um, to the interest that you pay and to um, your debt profile. So. Um, that's a general thing that's that's affecting not just Turkey, but as we've mentioned, you know, countries like Brazil, Argentina had to, in the last month, Argentina actually had to go to the IMF um, for a bailout package. So this is this is more, I think, the fear. Um, I'm not sure that we have a. I don't think we've got a kind of 1998 um, emerging market style crisis on our hands. I don't think it's as bad as that um, by any stretch of the imagination. I think actually a lot of these markets, particularly in Asia, have actually addressed the issues that they had back then. But still, in certain pockets, we, you know, we've seen um, we've seen what's happened to South Africa, to Brazil, to Turkey, um, to um, some of the other countries. Um, you know that that have not sort of 
um, been as cautious. Um, I think it's it's really isolated to those ones. I think India's been affected as well, actually. Um, yeah. So in terms of like those countries outside of the U.S., where would you be putting uh, your money? Like outside of the U.S. Um, well, it's a good question. I mean, I at the moment I'm kind of st steering clear of um, UK PLC uh, because of you know, the obvious uncertainties. Um, that's not the same as, as steering clear of the big UK international companies because, of course, they actually benefit from um, a falling pound. So, you know, if you look at what happened initially after the referendum result, uh, you, you got um, a big bounce in the FTSE 100 because most of the FTSE 100 constituents are, you know, foreign currency earners um, and they're big multinationals. So actually, you know, if you believe, if you think that the pound is going to continue to be weak on the basis of a um, uh, of, of a no deal Brexit, then clearly um, you'd be looking at those companies, um, whereas you wouldn't be looking at the the more domestically focused uh, UK companies. So kind of opposite to the US situation, actually, um, where, you know, people have been looking uh, at, at US companies that have been more domestically focused. Um, so I, I know it's, uh, you know, I'm not afraid to kind of grasp the nettle. I do, um, I do quite a lot of work on, uh, French, Italian, Spanish companies. So I'm seeing some stuff that looks interesting in Italy that's been indiscriminately hit, um, as a general kind of thing because of, um, the stuff that we've been talking about, but also because of the, uh, the domestic situation in Italy. Um, I think with Italy, you know, dare I say it, the, although I can see the bearish case, um, you know, the way I look at it is Italian politics, unstable, um, and kind of all over the place. So I'm 47 years old. That seems to have been, um, a recurring theme during my 47 years, or let's say my 35 years of, of being conscious of Italy. Um, so, you know, political instability in Italy is certainly not a new thing. Um, do I think the populist government in Italy is going to leave the euro? No, I don't. I don't think there's the appetite actually in, um, amongst the Italian electorate for that at the moment. Um, so I see some interesting situations there. I probably wouldn't go for the banks just because I think you're kind of, blowing, you know, you're kind of blowing into, against the wind there. You know, there's there's no point in trying to step in front of um, a steamroller. But there are other better situations that you can look at. Um, I think, you know, there are pockets of uh, beaten, beaten down stocks in Italy in particular, which are not, you know, which, which are kind of immune from um, the emerging markets, the Turkish situation. As I say, I'd stay clear of the banks for the time being, although actually, you know, with something like uh, San Paolo, I don't believe they've actually got much Turkish exposure at all. It's got a very solid balance sheet and it pays a really good dividend, which sounds boring. But when you look at the, you know, what's happened to the share price now, as I say, I think you probably want to wait for the momentum to change to turn there before you try and ride it. Because, you know, if you try and go too early, uh, you're probably going to be sat there. Uh, for some time, either with a, a situation that doesn't make any money or or actually you end up losing money before it goes in your favour. So I'd wait there for the momentum to turn. Um, I guess but, that makes uh, sense on the world, right? Boring's work in the US. So it's way, way the boring the dividend paying stocks in Italy. Yeah. Two paper, laundry detergents. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I you know, I like the, uh, they're boring, but I like the management team there as well. Um, you know, last year, well, after Unicredit did their capital raise and broke down a lot of the NPLs, they, you know, that was the kind of like the, the high beta stock, the high beta situation. Uh, that's OK if you want a bit of excitement. But then again, you know, they are the guys that own 40 percent of Turkey's fourth largest bank. So even though I don't think it's taken them down, I think you've, all, you've always got the headline risk there. All right, guys, I think uh, that's all we've got time for this week. Uh, thank you very much for joining me, Raj and Jason, and I look forward to catching up next time.
for you guys at home watching, uh, just remember that if you want to learn more about trading and investing with the Institute, just visit our website, ittn.com, where you can have a look at our upcoming live seminars, our courses, our bite-sized videos, uh, and okay. our mentoring programs that we have with guys like Raj and Jason, who can really take your trading to the next level. So I hope you guys enjoyed the show, and next time we'll be catching up with Institute mentors David Perlin and Chris Cathy.